Good Sabbath, everyone. Good Sabbath. Good to see everybody. Good to be here again. We're continuing today in our series, Who Are Seventh-day Baptists? The organization of the local church. Now, I know what I'm about to describe has only ever happened to me, but I still got to ask you anyway. Have you ever started to tell someone you were a Seventh-day Baptist and they either tried to finish your sentence with Adventist or they followed up with, Huh? I never heard of them. Well, amazingly enough, they're not the only ones who say that. In the 10 plus years or so that I've been uh, Seventh-day Baptist, I've traveled around to different Seventh-day Baptist churches, met different Seventh-day Baptists, and I've found that even some Seventh-day Baptists themselves are not always aware of who they are and what they believe. I myself have found the easy road to say, oh, we're just like any other Baptist except we go to church on Saturday. Day. And for most people, that's a what reasonable enough explanation they can understand. But sadly, many times it reveals a lack of understanding on the part of the Seventh-day Baptists themselves because it goes much deeper than that. That's one of the things that prompted this series to be sure we go over and everyone understands the basics of just what we mean when we say, I am a Seventh-day Baptist. Now, as we mentioned in our statement of belief and in our recent messages, Seventh-day Baptists practice the autonomy of the local congregation. The autonomy of the local congregation. This means that the congregation has complete authority over and responsibility for its own affairs. No group, whether denominational or otherwise, is recognized as having the authority to dictate how a local seven-day Baptist church should be run. Each congregation determines its own worship programs and organization. This is because as Baptists... We acknowledge no head of the church other than Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5 and verse 23 tells us that Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Furthermore, Seventh-day Baptist churches give allegiance to God when there is a clear and unavoidable conflict between his authority and the authority of secular governments. As the apostles said in Acts 5 and verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. So that implies the fact that we have the privilege of running things our own way, of Using the tradition, uh, I believe, as we talked about, uh, Brother Chuck, the tradition of the church of singing that song we sing when we first begin each service, God of the Sabbath. Um, it's very comfortable and familiar to do that. Is there a dictate to do that? Is there someone from the denomination or from the government saying, Thou shalt sing God of the Sabbath as you start each service? No, the local church decides that. That's the autonomy of the local church. What about beliefs? As we've talked about in the past, there are some churches who believe in having communion every single Sabbath. Others who only have it once a year. Some have it quarterly. Some have it monthly. It's not dictated by the denomination or anyone else. It's the local church's decision. The autonomy of the local church. Now, however, the autonomy of the local church is held in a tension, if you will, with similarly scriptural and the Baptist tradition of local churches working in association with other churches to better accomplish the work of the kingdom. 
We can do more as a group than we can as individuals. Does that make sense? Now, the fact that the church is universal, you know, we read Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church, his body. Was he just talking about Seventh-day Baptist paint, you know, paint rock or shepherd's fold or pocket tuck or, uh, you know, so on and so forth? Was he talking about just one individual church or the church as a group? He was talking about the church as a whole. See, even though we're in separate places, we're all part of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So the fact that the church is universal, that means it's worldwide, as well as local, brings an implication that no local church just sits here in isolation. We're not an island unto ourselves, if you will. Correct? Correct. Sometimes we may feel that way, but that's not the truth. There are many scripturals that abound of churches that consult with one another, such as in Acts 15, where Paul and Silas went to Jerusalem. What did they go to Jerusalem about? Do you remember? There were Pharisees where they were who were saying that Gentiles could not be saved unless they were circumcised. Do you remember that story? Yes. That's Acts 15. So they were preventing people from feeling like they were able to take advantage of the grace of God, accept Christ as their Savior. Well, you've almost gotten there, Brother Chuck. One more thing left. You've got to get circumcised. Can you imagine the division that brought in the church? The local church, mind you. And because this was all new and they were still trying to understand how things would work, Paul and Silas did what? They went to Jerusalem. Who was at Jerusalem? The apostles, the elders. They were there. They went for direction about this thing of Pharisees saying Gentiles could not be saved unless they were circumcised. And if you read that passage, in fact, why don't we go there? You find that... There was not one apostle that dictated the answer uh, on his own without consultation. In fact, as we go on, you'll find that uh, they worked as a group. There were certain men that came from Judea, and they taught the brethren, except you're circumcised, just like we were told to by Moses, you can't be saved. So after they had this huge agreement, disagreement and, and argument about this, the church there determined to send Paul and Barnabas and a few others to go to Jerusalem to ask the apostles and the elders about this question. And if you skip on down to verse 4, it says, When they went to Jerusalem, they were received by the church. Now notice this was not the only church. They're just talking about the fact it was the church at Jerusalem. And the apostles and the elders, and they declared everything that God had done with them. In other words, they didn't just come in and say, hey, we got this argument, we want you to decide. They told the whole story. We've been preaching the gospel both to the Jews and to the Gentiles, and as many as have heard it, many of them have come to know Jesus as their Savior. And we're so excited about it, they're being baptized, and then baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then right in the middle of it, there has become a problem. Many of those who came from Judea, the Pharisees, have said that this salvation is not complete without being circumcised. We've talked about it amongst ourselves. We do, we've not come to an agreement. And therefore, we have traveled all this way to bring it in front of you and ask for your help in determining the direction we need to go. Well, guess what? They didn't have an immediate answer. Verse 7 says, And after there had been much disputing. Wait a minute. I thought there were apostles here. They knew exactly what to do about every situation, right? That's not what this says, does it? They were arguing back and forth. They weren't doing any better than the church that Paul and Silas came from, were they? 
But all of a sudden, Peter stood up and he told them, Men and brothers, you know how a while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles, through my speaking, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Do you remember that? Remember that story where the sheet was let down and he was told to eat? And he said, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. You remember that story? And what was the point of that story? To get him to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ was for everyone on this earth, not just the Jews, right? So he's reminding them of this. He's saying, God, which knows hearts, Bear these folks witness, giving them the Holy Ghost the same way he did to us. He's basically saying, wait a minute. They're no different. God didn't withhold the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they weren't circumcised. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. The work of Jesus Christ did its work when they accepted Him as their Lord and Savior, is what He's saying here. And listen to the rebuke that He gives the entire group there. Now why do you tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of His disciples, which neither us nor our fathers were able to bear? Because we believe through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they are. He's saying, wait a minute here. The gospel of salvation has nothing about circumcision, isn't it? Does it? It says, if you believe, you will be saved. He's kind of, Peter's having to bring them back to the basics, isn't he? And all the multitude, they got quiet. <laughs> he made them think. So they turn and they let Barnabas and Paul talk and tell all these miracles and wonders that God had been doing through the Gentiles. Miracles and wonders. There weren't just people getting saved. There weren't just people getting baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. But God was working miracles through them. They were going and praying for you, Brother Bill, and you were being restored with strength. They were praying for you, Brother Chuck, and your eyes, you didn't need them glasses no more. You didn't need those hearing aids anymore, Sister Faye. They were working through the Gentiles. And I can just tell you right now, for a lot of those folks sitting there, it was blowing their mind. Because just like we do today, they had their blinders on. This is my world. This is what I understand. This is what I know. So this has got to be the only way it is. And after Barnabas and Paul finished, then James spoke and said, Men and brothers, now listen to me. Peter has declared how God has visited the Gentiles and to take out of them a people for his name. And this is according to Scripture, because it is written, After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and its ruins thereof, and will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord who doeth all things. So James is supporting Peter in what he has said and saying, Oh, by the way, the Scriptures, and they didn't have the New Testament then, folks. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's saying the Old Testament supports what's going on. Therefore, I tell you this. Let's not give them any more problems in getting saved. Those who are from among the Gentiles that have turned to God, let's write a letter to them with these few stipulations. Stay away from the pollution of idols. Don't commit fornication. Stay away from things that have been strangled and from blood. For Moses, since days of old, has in every city of those that preach, has been read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And everybody thought about it for a little bit. I said, you know what, you're right. 
It pleased the apostles and the elders. And it didn't stop there. The whole church at Jerusalem was satisfied with what had come up. The whole church. And they decided to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, named Barsabbas, and Silas, chief. And they wrote letters which basically said the same thing James said. Now why did they send people back? They sent people from Jerusalem to support Paul and Silas to say, we've talked about this and Paul and Silas are in the right. Stop trying to make them get circumcised. Do you see how this ties in with the way that we work together as churches? We're individual churches, but that does not mean that we operate in and of ourselves without any advice or outside help in determining the will of God. That's what we mean about the fact there's a tension between this thing of autonomy of the local church and association with other churches. We understand that we can do more as a group than we can as individuals. Another example of churches working together is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where Paul's taking up a collection for those suffering in Jerusalem. We also find churches recognizing the ministry of those who were sent from other churches to strengthen and encourage them in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2 where Paul said that Timothy was sent for this purpose. He sent a letter to them and said, this is what Timothy was sent for. We sent him to you to strengthen and encourage you. 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. How cool would that be, church? To raise up someone within our own and have enough sufficient extra to say, we're going to send that person over to Asheville to strengthen and encourage Asheville Seventh-day Baptist Fellowship. That's, what, that's the equivalent of what they did. Not to dictate how that church would be run, but to strengthen and fellowship with them, encourage them. We also see churches who were supporting workers, who were ministering beyond the boundaries of their own local congregations in Philippians 4, 15 through 18, where Paul sent them a letter and said, Thank you for supporting me in my ministry. We have done that same thing here at Shepherd's Fold, have we not, with the ministry that's going on in Arizona. That is a scriptural principle. All of this is in recognition of the fact that the New Testament church was more than just the church at Corinth or the church at Thessalonians or the church at Jerusalem. They were the church at Jerusalem, the church. But they were more than that. It was all of them together were simply the church. And we have evidence of places other than what we've already spoken, if you want. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. Ephesians 3, 21. Colossians 1, 24 through 25. Each of these clearly refer to the universal church, not to any particular local church. Now, for those of you who may not be aware, interesting sidebar, is uh, this is where the term Catholic church originated from. As Christianity spread across the lands, the Greek word kathikolos began to be used to describe the universal church we just discussed. That's what the word means. In English, we have Catholic and universal because we want to separate the denomination, the Catholic Church, from the universal church. But in the Greek at that time, the Catholic Iglesias is exactly what they meant. They meant the universal church. The universal church. They weren't talking about the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They're simply talking about the universal church when they said the Catholic Church. So it was only later on that it came to define what we know today as a denomination. 
So I want to be careful for folks who might be listening to understand that the word we're using universal here today does not mean to apply any reference to those denominations. It simply means we're talking about the church of God, the body of Christ as a whole. All right. Many of the principles we have discussed today and in recent messages demonstrate that congregational self-government is the form of church government, or another word we like to use is polity, but polity just means government, the form of church government which has the greatest support in teaching of Scripture. If you look through there in Scripture and you study, and we can do that at another time, uh, we as Seventh-day Baptists believe that congregational polity, congregational government, is the form of church government or polity which has the greatest support in teaching of Scripture. There are at least three types of church government. Did you realize that? We have those that are, again, like we see in the Catholic Church where the Pope is the head of the church and his dictates run down and through others. Um, there are those who are more uh, Presbyterian where that they elect elders or representatives and those uh, get together and they meet as a group and determine the direction of the church and the people don't have any say other than voting that person in or out. And then you have what we have, which is the congregational form of government, where every person has a voice. And when there comes something that needs direction within the church, we all get a chance to say what we believe the will of God is in that particular issue. Equality of the members of the body of Christ, Christ's headship of his body, and the teaching about the priesthood of all, all believers all these three together support the idea that the congregation should rule itself and not be dictated to by a single official or a committee. However, what we need to understand is that congregational polity, while found in Scripture, in fact in Acts 15 as we read, um, it's a broad concept. And it must be understood as such rather than a clearly defined methodology. There's nothing in here in the Bible that says you should meet quarterly for a business meeting. There's nothing here in the Bible that says there needs to be a uh, treasurer's report. But it certainly sets up the standard of when there is a question of what needs to be done. They gather together and discuss it seek the Lord's will, and work together as a group to determine what God's will is for that particular issue. You see, seeking a detailed organizational model for the New Testament church and scripture is impossible for a multitude of reasons. For one thing, you have to understand, even as we read here, this church was just forming. I mean, they were sprouting up churches everywhere, so it was kind of evolving, if you will, it's not like if you read through the Gospels, Jesus left this detailed model of here's how I want you to set up churches in every city, did he? So it's kind of evolving here. That's one issue. So officers and procedures were adopted which fit the growing needs of the churches as we saw in Acts 15. You can also see it in Acts chapter 6. Also, the details that were given about how these forms of organization were done are sketchy at best. There's almost an assumption, if you will, an understanding of what some of these roles and responsibilities were, which we today don't have because we weren't there. For example, there are those who argue that local churches today should have multiple elders rather than a single pastor. And, and they point to the many plural references to elders. You're supposed to have elders. Well, that's great when you have people. But when you have a person, sometimes that's what you end up with is an elder and not elders. Again, they met the needs of the local church. But here's another thing to ponder. As you read this elders that gather together there in Jerusalem... What about the fact that they didn't have any edifices, these great churches? They couldn't go to the synagogues. So where were they meeting? Where does Scripture say they were meeting? In their homes. 
So it's just as possible that the reason that there were elders of the church, that those were the leaders of each of the individual house churches that came together in one place. Now we have folks today who live in Blountville. We have folks today who live in Johnson City and Bristol and Jonesboro. If there were house churches in each one of those and you had an elder at each one of those house churches and we all came together to determine something, you would have elders. But it wouldn't necessarily mean that you had elders, plural, in each one of those individual churches, would it? So it's, you've got to be careful that you don't pull more out of Scripture than is actually there. However, in Matthew 23 and verse 9, I need to clear something up. As much as at least one of my beloved folks here wants to be told what to think and do, Scripture also denies that believers are to be dependent on any spiritual father or bossed around by those serving as pastors. You can look at Matthew 23 and verse 9 or 1 Peter 5, 2 through 3. Matthew 23, 9. He's telling this is tell them to go everywhere. Find everyone you can to the marriage. And in other words, he wasn't telling one person to do it. He was telling all of his servants to do it. First Peter five, two through three. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy money, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Peter's telling them how to serve, but he's also telling you what your pastor is not supposed to be, what your elders are not supposed to be. They're not supposed to be your lords, are they? They're not supposed to rule and dictate over some authoritative power struggle or that you're servants and they're the mighty leaders up on their pedestal. We need to understand that just because we have pastors or elders and that while they have the authority that was outlined in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, that responsibility for your soul, if you will, it does not mean that you set your mind on a shelf and do as this lady did I was mowing her yards for her when I was a late teenager and I began to talk to her about the Sabbath and we had a lively discussion and I was able to almost convince her of the truth of the Sabbath and she just all of a sudden held her hand out and said stop. I don't understand where this is going. All I know is what my pastor tells me and that's good enough for me. Folks, that's not scriptural just because I have a responsibility to encourage you and guide you and lead you does not relieve you of the responsibility to get in the word every day to read the Bible for yourself and to know what it is God tells you to do to pray and ask him to reveal to you the truths of his scripture can I get an amen, amen. amen. you see Paul made it clear even in 1 Timothy 5 19 through 20. That even though they have leaders who we in that time anointed, but we call it ordination, even though we've ordained them, recognize God's call on their mind, that they're not a law to themselves. I had a good friend of mine one time that he said that he struggled when he first got saved because about six months after he got saved, he was backsliding and he went to a bar one night and there sat his preacher that had led him to the Lord, drunk out of his mind. And he walked up to him and said, Pastor, you're the one that told me not to live this way, not to do these things. And yet you're here doing it. You know what his pastor said? He said, Boy, do as I say, not as I do. See, we can't make our own law. We're held to the same scriptural standard as you are. <clears throat> 
And that's what Paul was, or Peter was saying here in, in, in 1 Peter 5. But being an example to the flock in verse 3. An example to the flock. So we have to understand that while we do have folks who are in charge, who have a responsibility, that does not set them up higher than you. That does not alleviate you of the right and the privilege and the responsibility to search Scripture for yourself. Now while the details are limited, it seems clear that the early church functioned according to congregational polity. Even during a time of these uniquely authoritative apostles who were able to lay hands on the ordained and the thought was that they transferred the power of the Holy Spirit upon them. Even then, if you notice in Acts 15, decisions were still taken only with the approval of the church as a whole. It was the church which had authority to decide theological issues and the church which had authority to discipline in the cases of discipline. You remember in Matthew 18 how things were to be done? If your brother's overtaken in a fault, you go to him. And if you can get him to uh, uh, repent, then you've restored your brother. But if he doesn't repent, then what are you to do? You go back and you bring two more with you and you try to do it again. And if he still doesn't repent, where do you go? Do you take him to the pastor? You take him to the whole church. And you bring the matter up in front of the whole church. And if he still won't repent, then the church is to set him outside the church and let him know that he is not welcome until he determines to repent. The church has the authority. The church had the authority to send missionaries, as we read in Acts 13, and then to receive their reports when they get done in Acts 14. You see, this is the basis for this authority we believe it comes from Matthew 18, 20, where Jesus himself promised, where two or you are gathered, I will be in your midst. He's going to guide even two or three believers in determining the will of God. Do you believe that today, church? In the book, A Short Baptist Manual of Polity and Practice, they spoke about how this was originally conceived. When Baptists therefore advocated a congregational form of church government, they believed that a congregation of committed and informed Christians led by the Holy Spirit could be a sensitive and delicate instrument for seeking out the will of God. You notice it didn't say for determining what they should do. It didn't say for deciding what was the most popular thing to do, but for seeking out the will of God. They did not consider congregational decisions infallible in declaring God's will, but they believed that the full participation of the members would provide a check against the common human nature tendencies to self-interest and limitations that were imposed upon our own human knowledge. I'd like to add to that that sincere prayer and attentiveness to God's leading should also be a part of this process. And in fact, when I studied early Seventh-day Baptists, that was their practice. I've told you before, when they had their business meetings, how did they vote? All those who believe this is God's will, raise your hand. All those who do not believe this is God's will, raise your hand. And all those who have prayed and still don't know what God's will is, raise your hand. And the majority won. And that meant if nobody knew what the answer was, and most of the people didn't know the answer, they didn't do anything. They just tabled it and waited for a while and came back to it again. They prayed until they knew God's will. This is how congregational polity should work. So in conclusion, the themes we have discussed today are the autonomy of the local church, the universal church, and congregational polity. And I understand these issues may not impact us in our everyday walk with God, but they are an important set of issues to understand when you're simply informing people you're a seven-day Baptist or when you're explaining to them just what that means. Now next week we're going to cover baptism and the Lord's Supper as it relates to the seven-day Baptists. That will be the final installment of organization of the local church. And from there we'll move on in to the Sabbath. May God bless and lead you in the coming week. Amen.